Satan sees suffering as the opportunity to destroy the faith of a Christian. Some Christians see suffering as a situation where they feel envious and frustrated toward those who do not have to suffer. Some people are fortunate enough to live their entire life without suffering. But most of us will find a time in our life where we have to make peace with suffering. The time comes where we have to accept and understand that this world is not our home and that sin has damaged the material creation as we noted in our first lesson on this series. God created the world perfect. God created the world without suffering. God created the world very similar to what we read about heaven will be like. But because Adam and Eve sinned and because we too have sinned, the problems in the world, sickness and death and injury and lack of dominion have all come as a result of sin. So Paul, I think, gives us maybe the best passage for making peace with it when it comes, whatever it might be. It could be something very terrible and very serious or it could be something relatively minor but Paul says I reckon and the term reckon is a bookkeeper's term it means that I've added up all the debits and I've added up all the credits I've worked it all through and of course he's inspired by the Holy Spirit so this is not man-made reckoning but Paul is telling us that the sufferings of this present time no matter what they are no matter how serious no matter how long lasting no matter how uh, much they impinge on our lives they are not worthy And the term worthy is also similar to a bookkeeping term. It's like the balancing scales where you put something on one side and you put something on the other. So we have a reckoning, we have a balancing. We're looking at the sufferings of this present time. We're going to talk about Paul and some of the sufferings so we can get an idea of what he's talking about. But he says that they are not worthy. When you add up all of the suffering and then you place on it the glory that is coming, the eternal glory, the eternal dominion, the the eternal uh, beauty of heaven and this new body that is going to be incorruptible and undefiled and and never suffer again, uh, which shall be revealed to us. So Paul, I believe Paul knew suffering uh, far more or far better than we do. And let's look at a few things. I'm not going to read this whole verse. I just want to look at the yellow parts. He says, uh, we hunger and thirst. Poorly clothed, beaten, homeless, labor, reviled, persecuted, defamed, made as the filth of the world, and the offscouring of all things. So Paul is dealing primarily here, not so much with disease or illness or financial setbacks. He's dealing here with the day-to-day problems of life. Things that oftentimes we don't even think about when we think about suffering, and that is going hungry, going to bed hungry. I remember the first time I met a friend from Malawi. He told me that, There were times in April when the harvest hadn't come yet and there wasn't any food. And sometimes we'd have to wait two or three or four weeks before there'd be any food. And that's suffering. That's a suffering that you and I don't have to to deal with. Uh, Poorly clothed and beaten and homeless. These two were things that Paul understood when we talk about suffering. And most of us, if we were thrown into any of these situations where we no longer had a home or we were poorly clothed or somebody beat us, we would consider that to be maybe above and beyond the sufferings that Paul's talking about in uh, Romans chapter 8. Then in verse 13, he speaks of being defamed and being made as the filth of the world and the offscouring of all things until now. But he doesn't stop there. He then goes on to say, in labors more abundantly, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews, five times I receive, receive 40 stripes Minus one. Now you read over that quickly, but think about that. Five separate times Paul was taken by the Jews, put into prison, and told, you're going to have to endure this again. He'd already had it once, and twice, and three times, and so his body knew how painful this was going to be. Three times, he says, I was beaten with rods. The difference, of course, being that the Romans didn't count it. They just beat until they were tired. Did they beat until the man passed out? Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. You know, you talk about post-traumatic stress. 
We talk about terrible things that have happened to people and how they carry that with them. Look at what Paul had to deal with. If a man could have to deal, most soldiers don't have to deal with the kind of problems that Paul is describing here, but he doesn't stop there either. Journeyings often, perils of waters, perils of robbers, perils of my own country, perils of the Gentiles, perils in the city, perils in the wilderness, perils in the sea, perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness, often couldn't get a night's sleep, in cold, excuse me, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. You know, one of the things that I've learned by going to Malawi is, is that when you're completely in the hands of the brethren, you eat when they make it. And sometimes, as Paul notice, notes here, uh, you go hungry and you go thirsty. And sometimes you have to fast. Sometimes it's cold and there's not enough clothing to wear. Besides the other things, what comes upon me daily? My deep concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I'm not weak? Who is made to stumble and I do not burn with indignation? Then on top of that, Paul speaks of a thorn of the flesh. People have studied it. What is it? Was it some kind of an illness? Is it some kind of an infirmity? Some kind of a sore? Uh, he tells the Corinthians, you would have given me your eyes, which leads some people to think maybe there was a problem with his eyes. Whatever it was, it was a messenger of Satan to buffet me. This was a serious problem, whatever it was. So much so, verse 8, concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. I would challenge anyone to put their sufferings on the side of the scale and then look at what Paul went through and say, Paul doesn't have a clue. Paul could write that, but he really doesn't understand because he's never really suffered. And of course, that wouldn't be true even if that were the case because he's inspired. But from a personal perspective, as you look at these things, and this isn't all, there's a lot of other verses we could look at. But this gives us a pretty good idea. And here is Paul's final decision or final conclusion. He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. Remember, Paul said, I besought the Lord three times that he would remove this thorn in the flesh, this messenger of Satan that was buffeting me day after day after day. The Lord's answer, my grace is sufficient. In other words, you're going to heaven. You are, if, if we were to quote Romans chapter 8 now, the sufferings of this present world are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall afterwards be revealed. That's what Jesus is saying here. Now notice what he says. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities. Instead of coming into the church building and talking about how we have been blessed and how many wonderful things are happening, Paul says no, and he's not complaining, he's not whining, he's simply saying that I'm going to boast in my infirmities. That the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now, keep this in the back of your mind, because later on we're going to read where Paul says, I have learned the secret of how to be content in whatever circumstances I find myself in. And so the answer is right here. And I think essentially what Paul is saying, and it's something all of us have to learn at some point between our youth and our death, and that is we have to learn how to let go. This world is a beautiful place. And many people fill every moment with the enjoyable things of this life. And when a health problem comes or a persecution comes and removes that, many people fall into a depression, they fall into uh, a, a glumness, they, they, get, uh, they, they get what we what do we call post-traumatic stress, they, they feel that life just isn't what it ought to be. Well, it isn't. It isn't what it ought to be. We saw that back in the first sermon when we talked about how God created a perfect world, but sin has changed it to be not what it ought to be. But Paul says, I've learned how to take pleasure in infirmities. Now, again, that's part of the secret. And we'll come back to this uh, before we finish the lesson. So he says to the Philippians, not that I speak in respect of need or in regard to need. For I have learned in whatever state I am, to be content. 
So if you go back through all of the things, the perils of robbers, the being stoned, uh, being five times beaten, three times with rods and the shipwrecks, yeah, the hunger, the thirst, he says, I've learned. I've learned something. Through all of those things, I've learned something very important that I want to share with you. And it, it comes down to that Romans 8.18, the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared. In other words, stop looking here and start looking beyond. Until we do that, we will never be able to handle suffering. So I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. I know how to be beaten. I know how to be stoned. I know how to be uh, struck with rods. I know how to be hungry. I know how to fast. I know how to deal with this thorn in the flesh. I know how to deal with persecutions and being reviled and hated and mistreated. Everywhere... And in all things, I have learned the secret, both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, remember what Jesus said in that previous verse, in verse 9. My grace sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Now, the day we finally comprehend what this is talking about, and sometimes it takes a lot. Sometimes Christians figure this out without any suffering at all. And sometimes Christians have to go through severe excuse me, severe sufferings before they finally reach the level of what Paul is describing here. My strength is made perfect in weakness. You know, Jesus spoke about this. He said, the cares of the world, the desires of other things, the riches of this world choke the word and you become unfruitful. So there's a balance between a life where there is no suffering and therefore we don't learn this secret and the life where there is too much suffering too quickly and we become bitter or we begin to wonder whether this work for the Lord is worth it. We, we signed on because we thought God was going to take care of us. We signed on because we thought that God was going to give us every blessing and he will. But it says every spiritual blessing physical side of this, as Jesus points out to Paul, it's actually better to go through these weaknesses. And that was Paul's final conclusion. After Jesus told him, my strength is made perfect in weakness, and he's telling us too through Paul, he says, therefore, most gladly, I will boast in my infirmities. In other words, I will feel a sense of esteem and a sense of pride and a sense of value, not because of my wealth or because of my accomplishments or because of the glory and joy of my life, but because of my infirmities. <clears throat> therefore, he says something which is shocking. I take pleasure in infirmities. Brethren, those are, those are polar opposites. That's like light and darkness for most people. If I'm suffering, I'm not taking pleasure. If I can learn to take pleasure in sufferings, in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecution, in distresses, then, as Paul says in this next verse, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, let's just pause for a moment and let's take stock here. How do you feel about this? I mean, do you think Paul's right? Well, that's a dumb question. Well, no, it's not. It's, it's one thing to say it with your head. It's another thing to say it with your heart. Do we really agree with Paul that we could be happy in all these situations? And a lot of us would have to admit, I don't know, because I've never been there. It's easy to say, here's what I'm going to do when I get into this situation. But you never know what you're going to do when you get in the situation. Uh, Job's dark day where he lost all of his possessions and his children in a single day. And then a few months or years later, he lost his health and his relationships with all of his friends and even his wife. And he was having horrible dreams and miserable situations. And it, it was a struggle. He, he lost his way because of his three friends. He lost his way. He never... He never renounced God like his wife asked him to do. But he started doubting God's goodness. He started doubting God's fairness. He started saying things like, you know, it doesn't seem to make any difference whether you're righteous or not because God's going to treat you the same either way. And that's when God appears and says, who is this who darkens words without knowledge? <clears throat> Suffering seems seemingly had no impact on Paul. He was content 
regardless of his outer state. You say, well, what more could God, have, what more could have been thrown at him? You remember what he said after the riot at Ephesus? He said, I had the death sentence passed inside of me. In other words, I had the spirit of life. I knew I was going to die that day. I was ready to go out there. And of course, we remember the story. His, the, he had some friends among the leaders and they begged him and actually restrained him from going out there. He said, it's going to be okay. Paul was so worried about the riot and the people that they'd captured, he was willing to go in there and give his life for it. So this is what, uh, what, what Paul was. Now, the reckoning that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to com be compared with the glory which shall be revealed to usward. Now, how does this work? Well, let's look at the rest of the verse. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. We're not in this alone. We're not the only ones that are suffering. The animal kingdom, they're suffering. The vegetable kingdom, they're suffering. That's those poor trees in that fire. If, if life's just wonderful and perfect, and I'm just being facetious, but the point is, the whole creation is dealing with the curse of sin. And he goes on to say, not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit. Now, here's the, here's the, uh, the paradox or the, or the contrast. Here's the rest of the world. We're redeemed. Our soul's redeemed. We have the first fruits of the Spirit. We don't deserve this anymore. Uh, we, we shouldn't have to suffer these things because we have been forgiven. But notice what he says. We ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. The redemption of our soul occurred when we were baptized. And the redemption of our soul is something that we simply have to hold on to. It was given to us at our baptism and it will remain with us. And it's part of the every spiritual blessing. Because we have the redemption of our soul, we can worship God. We can offer prayers to God. God will hear us. He will give us all kinds of wonderful blessings and, and freedoms. But not the redemption of our body. Body is just the same as it was before we were baptized. Nothing happened. Nothing changed. Uh, whatever proclivities that we have toward illness, whatever proclivities we have toward uh, difficulties and problems, these persecutions that are going to come along, that, doesn't, that isn't going to be resolved. We're waiting for the adoption. So the sufferings of this present time in the context is not, oh, this is so unusual. I'm the only one that's going through it. No, the whole creation is going through this. And so also are those of us who have the first fruits of the Spirit. Uh, every Sunday morning, we make announcements about those who have the first fruits of the Spirit. This person's having this problem. This person's having this problem. And sometimes it's easy because you don't know who they are and you feel a little bit of sympathy for them, but you don't really get into empathy because you don't know who they are. But if it's your family or if it's you, now suddenly it becomes a whole different matter. <clears throat> Part of the secret, part of what we have to learn. We faint not, Paul said. Now you could plug all that in, everything we've just read about Paul. We don't despair. We don't, we don't, even, we don't even feel any exhaustion. We're not tired. We're not, we're not ready to give up. Why, Paul? How can you do that? Though our outward man is decaying, our inward man is renewed day by day. Now, that's an interesting application Paul's making here. Not only is he having all these things going on, but he's getting old. Uh, that stoning that we read about uh, probably occurred. Remember he said, I know a man in Christ 14 years ago, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. Well, that's just about the time that Paul was leaving Iconium, going into Lystra and Derby, and that's when he was stoned. Paul was still a relatively young man then. You remember when it says uh, in Acts chapter 8 that the, the garments were laid at a young man named Saul? So Paul was young. He was converted not long after that. And it hasn't been maybe, what, five or ten years since that occurred. So he's a relatively young man. But by the time he's writing the first Corinthian, the second Corinthian letter, we're talking about maybe 15 or 20 years later. And it's just about maybe eight years until he writes Timothy and says, I'm Paul the aged one. So the shift has occurred, and not only is Paul dealing with all of those things, but now he's talking about old age. 
and the aches and pains. We don't usually recognize them as suffering. We just recognize them as things are slowing down. Verse 17, for our light affliction. How can Paul say light affliction? How can Paul say, after adding all of those things, I mean, put all the stuff that he wrote about on one side of the scale, and then he says, I reckon the sufferings of this present world are not worthy to be compared. Now he calls it a light affliction. I'd say he's exaggerating, but he's not, because he's learned this secret. Verse 17, our light affliction, which is but for the moment, works for us more and more exceeding, exceedingly an eternal weight of glory. All right, now here's that glory again. Our sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory. Worthy is the balancing scale. So we have the same thing here. On one side, light affliction, which is but for a moment, the sufferings of this present time. The other side, an eternal weight of glory. Verse 18, here's the secret. We look not at the things which are seen, and that's why I said a moment ago, part of the purpose for suffering is learning how to let go, learning how to understand that I don't have to have all these things in this life to be happy because I'm focusing on the future. Now, the more things that we have in this life that are making us happy, the less able we are to do this. And that's why Paul said, when Jesus told me my weakness is made, or excuse me, my strength is made strong in weakness, Paul said, I let go. And I said to myself, I'm going to focus more now and Paul has a maturity that even though I can see these things, it's tough, to, it's tough to understand what he understood. And I guess really the only way you could do it would be to go through those troubles over and over again until you were forced to. Uh, most of us will have a suffering, but we'll come back out of it. We look, verse 18, not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. Do we do that? Have you learned that yet? Is our self-esteem and comfort and joy and happiness based more on what's coming when this life is over or is it based more on what we have right now? And that's a tough question, especially for us in this prosperous age that we live in. It's really tough for us to let go. And it's one of the reasons why the gospel is so... Uh, powerless, and I hate to use that word, but it's so powerless among the American people right now because they haven't had this rude awakening that Paul is describing here. And they may not. But I'll tell you one thing, if, if our country goes through a terrible war or a terrible depression or a terrible cataclysm, a lot of people are going to be forced to to deal with this. Now they may not reach Paul's level, but at least they're going to see that they that, that it's there. So we don't look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. Suffering helps to focus on that. That's the glory, that's the boasting that Paul says about suffering. There is a benefit to it. And uh, even James will read this verse in just a few moments. He said, You heard of the patience of Job, and you've seen the end of the Lord, and you understand that it helped him to become a better person. So we're not looking at the things that are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal or temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So for, sadly enough, for most people, it's the temporary things that get them through life. It's the temporary things that help us to want to serve God and praise God and honor God. We're not, we're not often looking at the eternal things. Until the temporary things are removed, it's pretty tough to see beyond them. And so as a young man, you, you, you've probably heard this, I've heard this, it's pretty tough to talk to an 18-year-old about heaven because he's more focused on his life here. He's got his whole future ahead of him. And as Ecclesiastes writer, Rejoice, O young man, in your youth and enjoy, but know that these things are going to bring you to judgment. Now, that's not how you write to a 90-year-old or an 80-year-old. Now it's a whole different ballgame. So it's sad that for many people, the, what holds them to God are just temporary things. What's holding them to God is our food, our clothing, our shelter, our wealth, our happiness, our contentment, uh, our blessings. Paul said, I, didn't, I don't have any of those. Uh, what I have is a loss of all those things. We're the scouring, we're the off scouring of all things. God has set forth the apostles, men doomed to die. And yet, 
In some respects, I think Paul was a lot happier than most Christians because of his focus. And so this is a question we all have to ask ourselves. The things which are not seen, the eternal things, the exceeding weight of glory, he said in verse 17. The light affliction of the things that are seen compared with the more and exceeding eternal weight of glory of the things which are not seen. <clears throat> so suffering is like a tunnel. You first get thrown into it, especially the first time. When we get hit with something, you remember how I started the lesson, making peace with suffering, reconciling with suffering? At some point, we're going to find ourselves in this cave. And at some point, we may not see any way out of it. And at that point, we may feel like, where's God? Where's God? I don't understand. I, I, I can't find a way out. I can't, I can't, I haven't learned the secret yet. Uh, I'm, I'm struggling like the man in Psalm 73 who said my feet had almost slipped because I was arrogant at those who didn't have any problems when I'm suffering all day. Or as Job who was really struggling. But when you see that tiny glimmer, and this is not the best picture in the world, but you can see now there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Now what happens if you see that glimmer of light? It's coming to an end. Now, for some people, it has to be physical, but not for Christians. For Christians, we don't have to see it coming to an end physically because just beyond is an eternal way to glory. And so the light at the end of our tunnel is always present, but sometimes you've got to get thrown into the tunnel without any light in order to realize, hey, there is light at the end of this tunnel. So as you are walking out of the problem, nothing's really changed. Most of the time when people fall into a terrible situation of suffering, uh, you're still lost in the cave, you're still hungry, you're still bruised, but now it doesn't matter anymore because you can see beyond. You can see the light out there. He's still This guy is still in the tunnel, but he's not in the tunnel. Because he's, his hope is focused there. Now that's what Paul's talking about. That's what, what the Hebrew writer, when he said, who for the joy that was set before him endured the, tro the cross, he was in the darkness of the cross, but he was already looking beyond. Now that's a secret that every one of us has to learn. And again, it doesn't happen. The moment that you're thrown into the suffering, you do feel like you're in a cave. I felt that way several times in the last few weeks with different things that are going on in life. You just get hit with something that you never expected. And you haven't been able to internalize it. You haven't been able to make peace with it yet. And so you're just kind of wrestling, feeling lost. And why me? And why is this happening? And how are we going to deal with this? And then over time, you start looking at the eternal things and you start realizing, okay, let's let's reevaluate. Let's change our focus Let's start realizing life isn't what you expected. You know, as a young man, we just kind of figured life is going to be one step after another. It's going to be wonderful. And then life begins to unfold. So here's what Paul says. I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed to us work. We will all fall into the darkness, the darkness of despair. There's no, no matter how much faith you have, you can reach a point where uh, you're almost, I don't know how to go on. I don't know how to, I don't know how to move past this. I don't, know how to, I don't know how to deal with the struggles here. And then, as I say, we start going to the scriptures. You remember that man in Psalm 73? He said, my feet had almost slipped until I went into the sanctuary and I considered their latter end and I realized what a complete fool I was, and I'm glad I didn't say one thing while I was in that cave, while I was in that circumstance, because now I can see beyond it. And that's where we all are, and that's what we all have to understand. If Paul was able to do it with everything we read about was in his life, if Jesus was able to do it as he stood in the Garden of Gethsemane, weeping as blood dripping off of him, but there was still joy. Because he could see the light at the end of the tunnel. 
So we know we're learning the lesson when we can glory in tribulations. Now, Paul said that about himself. You remember he said in 2 Corinthians, after the Lord told me my grace is sufficient for you and my strength is made powerful in weakness, I started boasting in my tribulations. Now, 2 Corinthians was written just about the same time that the 1st and 2nd Corinthians were written. And the reason we know that is because Paul tells the Romans in chapter 15, I'm getting ready to take the collection to Jerusalem to the needy saints there. So he's, and he's already said, it was the good pleasure, pleasure of the Gentiles to give this money. And, and, and so he's, this is the period. It's, it's after 1 Corinthians 16 was written, but it's before he's actually gone. So it's right in between. So what Paul's saying here, he's also telling the Corinthians when he talks about all of his suffering in 1 Corinthians and his suffering in 2 Corinthians and then his thorn in the flesh. And then he says, I have learned. So here he is now saying the same thing, except now it's in the plural. He's not talking about himself anymore. He's talking about all of us. This is something we all need to learn. We also all need to do. And so do we glory in our tribulations? Or do we wallow in them? Now, as I said, I don't think there's any possible way. The first, the day, the day the doctor comes out and says, I've got this terrible news for you, I don't think these things happen at that moment. We've got a lot of internalizing to do. We've got a lot of things to learn. As Paul said, I had to learn the secret. And we all have to learn it. And it doesn't come simply by, oh, I see all of this. It's like driving a car. I mean, you can watch all the movies and you can say, I'm ready to go drive that car. Well, you're not. And even if you could drive it, you're certainly not experienced and you're going to have some serious problems because it takes time to learn these things. So Paul says we glory in tribulations. Why? Knowing tribulations produce perseverance. And perseverance, character. And character, hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Now, this is three chapters before he says, I reckon the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that should be revealed. But I know I'm learning the secret when I can start feeling a sense of self-esteem at the prospect of going through this. A sense, there's a reason for this. There's a purpose for this. There is value to this. When we learn that, then we are on the cusp. We are on the very foot or doorstep or threshold of going in to this wisdom. And so we need to ask ourselves our question, do we have, or this question, do we have this sense of self-esteem and a, a sense of privilege because I'm being put through this? Because it's getting me ready for that light at the end of the tunnel. Now, that's what Paul is saying here. We may or may not agree with this, but it would simply tell our spiritual maturity in the eyes of God if we said, how can that be? How can we feel a sense of self-esteem and a sense of glory and a sense of, of pride in going through a tribulation? Well, like Paul said, we have an eternal weight of glory. And this is adding to it. So, do we know that tribulation is producing perseverance? Perseverance means the ability to go on when there's no reason to go on. You've heard of the perseverance of Job. Job went on after he lost his children, after he lost his possessions, and his wife said, curse God and die. And he said, you speak like one of the foolish women. Produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character. Here's one of the main reasons why I think suffering is such an important thing. It creates character. This is something that I think if we look back, you know, we talk about the greatest generation, the generation that went through the Depression and went through World War II. They had character. And they, and I'm not saying we don't, I'm saying that the whole generation did. Some of us do, and that's the point. The point is, if you want to be like that greatest generation, then we have to manufacture through the circumstances in our own lives what they had because of the circumstances of the world that they were in. And verse 5, I'm sorry, and character produces hope. Now, we also know we're learning 
when, as, as he says here, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Now, the first time you read that, just like the first time we read that Paul could take pleasure in thirst and hunger and fastings and beatings and shipwrecks and stonings, he could take pleasure in that. But he said he did. And the Holy Spirit agreed. And therefore, it's the truth. And we need to learn the same thing. Count it all joy when you fall in manifold trials or various trials. Health trials, financial trials, persecution trials, old age trials, uh, massive, difficult trials. Count it all joy. First time you read that, you're just kind of shaking your head thinking, wow, how, how can that be? And some of us still would have to say, how can that be? But once you've gone through enough of these, it starts making sense. It starts to click. You start realizing, you know something? I've got too many eggs in the basket of this world. And it's time to start emptying that out and start looking over here. And that's when the joy will come because it's working for us an eternal way to glory. Verse 3, here's where, the, here's where the joy comes from. The testing of your faith produces patience. Now, that's the same word as Paul's perseverance in Romans chapter 5. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So now I learned something. I will never be perfect and I will never be complete until I've gone through suffering because it's only by going through suffering that we can learn the secret of how to be content because there's no secret to being content if we go through life just being happy every day of our life. This is a secret that can only be learned by being plunged into grave suffering. And so the Lord says, Alan, you want to be suffering today? Oh, Lord, yes, I do. I'm not going to do that. You're not going to do that. But if it comes, as I say, when you, when you first hit it, it's just like jumping into the ice water and you just you take your breath away. And then after a while, you're still in the water. You're still in the cave. And you start to, okay, what now? Am I going to lay down and die? Am I going to despair? Am I going to quit serving God? Or am I going to pick my, gird up my loins and get busy? Let perfect have its perfect work. That you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And then, which I, I really appreciate, James says, and if you can't do it, if you lack wisdom, and who doesn't? This is this is this is uh, uh, what would you call postgraduate studies of Christianity. This is this is this is tough. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. <clears throat> so the applications, my brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Now, we don't just have to take the prophets. We've got Paul. We've got Paul who says that you should follow my example, not only in the things he talks about in Philippians chapter 2 and Philippians chapter 3, but in all the other realms. My brethren, take the prophets, take Paul, take Jesus as examples. Indeed, we count them blessed who endured. You have heard the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord. That the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Now, it's kind of tough to see that when the doctors just come out and said you've got six months to live. It's kind of tough to see that when the uh, police officer just called and said your family's been in an accident in their own hospital. But at some point, that's the answer. That's the only answer there is, especially when there's not going to be a good outcome. Then we have to, we have to fall into this. The end intended by the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Think about it, brethren. We are in the midst of a sin-cursed world. We've just barely come out of the darkness. We can't see things very clearly. And God has done everything he can to help us get through all of this. And I think that's why suffering is here. It's very helpful. <clears throat> so we conclude with Paul's words in the book of Philippians. And you know, I, oh, there it is. It's in the title. I thought, man, I missed the main part. Uh, be anxious for nothing. Now, we've talked about this verse before. 
The tense of the verb is critical here. It means do not be continuously anxious. It is physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually impossible when you first get the information that somebody's dying. You say, oh, don't be anxious. Don't care. Jesus was anxious in the garden. There's nothing wrong with that sense of anxiety that initially comes, but don't keep it. That's why I say you get thrown into the ice water, you get thrown into the cave, you get thrown into a terrible situation, you start feeling a little despair, you start feeling a little depressed, you start feeling a little bit shaken. Don't stay there. Don't be continuously anxious for anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving... Let your request be made known to God. In other words, every suffering has a request. Every need has something we can bring to God. And sometimes, maybe the only thing is, Lord, please give me the wisdom. Please give me the wisdom to understand this. In everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Jesus or through Christ Jesus. Now we understand when you go to Paul and you chart Paul's life and you see, I've learned the secret. The peace of God comes when we get our minds in sync with the truth. And it passes all understanding because it doesn't make sense. As we've read through this, I'm sure there have been a few times in this lesson where you've looked at this and you've said, oh, that, that's a paradox. How can that be? But the time will come where it all makes perfect sense. Sadly, often it doesn't happen until you get hit with something that is so agonizing that you're finally forced to come to grips with these scriptures that we've kind of ignored. We've kind of, oh, they're in there, but I don't need them. I don't need to worry about these things. They've never happened to me. But the day will come when they will. And so as we end this lesson and, of course, this series on suffering, we need to realize that God has a purpose for everything. Remember Ecclesiastes chapter 3? There is a time and a purpose for everything under heaven. And there's a need and a purpose for suffering. And it's tied directly to sin and it's tied directly to our salvation. And so when we think, well, why did God make the world such a terrible place? We made the world a terrible place. He just changed the physical creation to mirror what we brought spiritually into the world. And I think there's so many comparisons and so many illustrations from the physical troubles and trials of this life that help us to understand a lot of parables that help us explain many different things in this life. So as we now turn to our own spiritual lives, as we're getting ready to leave here, and we have to make some decisions. You've heard a lot of information today. Uh, some of it has nothing to do with our eternal life. A lot of it does. But we're going to be singing number 335 in just a moment. And we need to think about, is there an eternal way to glory waiting for me? The answer is no, unless I'm a faithful Christian. Unless the blood of Christ has cleansed me from my sin, unless I'm living a godly life, suffering alone will not give me an eternal way to glory. Going through suffering and dealing with suffering and enduring suffering has a wonderful fruit. But that won't bring eternal life. Only living for Jesus. Only putting our confidence and our trust in Him and repenting and cleansing ourselves from our sins. And so if there's anyone in the audience this evening who has heard these things and would like to have that eternal way to glory. If there is still sin in your heart, you're not going to get it. And if you haven't obeyed the gospel, you're not going to get that eternal way to glory. If we can help you in any way, would you please let us know while we together stand and sing.